Good morning. We'd like to welcome you to our morning worship service. We're thankful for your presence and everybody else's presence, both members and visitors. And to all of our visitors, we're indeed honored that you took your time to worship with us. <coughs> Excuse me. Invite you back any time in the future that you are in our area to worship with us. To all of our visitors, our guests from our immediate community, we invite you any of our services, all of them that you can attend. Each Sunday morning at 9 a.m., we have Bible classes of all ages, 10 o'clock worship service, 6 p.m. Sunday night worship, midweek Bible studies at 6.30 on thir Wednesday night. We invite you to any of these services, or all of them that you can attend. We appreciate while the announcement's being made, someone from each family, both members and visitors, take a card that's found on the pew in front of you. Fill this out. This will be taken up at the end of our service. On a prayer list or a sick list, need to remember these people. Uh, Mickey King, who is Christy and Bridget, Bridget's uh, dad, got a very good pathology report regarding his pancreatic cancer, so we're thankful for that. And if he going to more information be on that later on. Also remember David Watson, uh, brother Mr. Harold Wood is in with us today, and we're thankful that he's able to return back with us for that. We're, for, he's been unable to worship with us for us. I don't know, several weeks now, but able to be here today, so we're thankful for that. Uh, Glenn Gilmer had uh, some surgery this past week. Uh, make sure you remember th these people that's been mentioned and also the are shut-ins and anything that we can do for them. Announcements pertaining to the congregation. There will be a graduation celebration party for Blaine Hall and Ryland Herndon tonight after the evening's worship. Everyone's invited on this. Uh, we will begin cleaning out the fellowship hall tomorrow for the kitchen renovation slated to begin in May. If you can help, please Janine, see Janine. Men, if you can help move big shelves in the storage area, make sure you check with Wally. Also, uh, make sure that you're leaving things, personal belongings in the seats and the pews and here from week to week. Uh, make sure you take those home with you and uh, the, the racks and behind the pew in front of you is for Bibles and psalm books. Make sure you take your personal belongings uh, out of the out of here. If you, it'd be appreciated. Also, trash that be thrown in there. They have garbage cans around. Put it in that. That help will be appreciated. Enough. Uh, order of worship this morning. Lee Wright will be leading our song service. Garrett Hill will be leading the first prayer. But the Gifford bring the message appropriate time and be dismissed with Scott Gilmer. This time we begin a worship service. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Number 678, please. 678, please. <clears throat>
681, please. 681, please. <coughs> Y'all please use your books. The video, the uh, screen is not working out at the moment. 681, please. For our prayer, <clears throat> number 591, please. 591. <clears throat> there we go. Thank you, gentlemen.
pray together this morning. Father, we lift our voices in song to you. We raise our thoughts in prayer. We gather together this morning to worship you. Father, we pray that what we do will be pleasing in your sight and that you will accept our worship. Father, we declare you are worthy of praise and all honor and all glory is truly yours. We acknowledge as we gather this morning the gift of salvation and that it can only be found in you. What a gift it is, Father, to be cleansed, to be made whole again. In so doing, we recognize that there are things of this life that can sometimes distract us that are ultimately worthless. Father, we pray as we worship you this morning that we will set aside all distractions and instead focus solely on you, praising you, recognizing what you have done for us. Father, you made the world and the heavens, and one day you will judge the world. Father, how fearful it would be to be judged by you and to be found wanting. And yet, without your love and your grace and your mercy, we would all find ourselves in such a condition, a fearful expectation. Father, we offer you our praise and our unending thanks for the opportunity to be reunited with you, to return to you, to have eternity with you in your presence forever. We pray that you will continue to be with us as we strive and work towards our common goal of being pleasing in your sight, especially as we worship you this morning. It's through your son that we pray. Amen. take the Lord's Supper and remember what the Lord did for us. Let's sing together number 471, please. 471, please. <clears throat> Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and for this opportunity you've given us to come together and worship you. We thank you, Lord, for sending your Son to die for us. We pray that as we partake of this bread that represents his body, that we do so in a manner pleasing to you, remembering his ultimate sacrifice. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.
continuing on. Oh Lord, most graciously, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessings you have given us throughout our lives, especially for your Son, who gave his life upon the cross for the mission of our sins. Help us to partake of the symbol of his blood that was spilled on the cross. Help it to wash over us and strengthen us. And help us to do the things which were right in his and your eyes. And we ask for this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we thank you for another week for us to be able to come together to worship you. Father, at this time, we want to offer to you our thanksgiving for all that you've given us here on earth, Father, for us to be able to both make a living, for us to be able to live comfortably, sometimes to excess, Father. We mindful of all the gifts you've given us and at this time we ask that we reason within our hearts to set aside to give back to you to help to further your kingdom here on earth we ask this in jesus name amen Five five two, please. Five fifty two, please. <clears throat>
Number 377, please. 377. Oh, yes, excuse me. And if you'd like to mark in your handles number 920, that will be our song of invitation. 920. And then 377 will do right now. Excuse me. If you wish to stand, please feel free. <clears throat>
<clears throat> good morning, church family. Morning. It is so good to be here and to worship God in this place. Uh, we are indeed uh, a family, and we're aiming to be more and more like a family with each passing day. And I'm appreciative for your faithful service, for your interest in spiritual matters. And if you happen to be visiting with us this morning, thank you so very much for coming our way. I know that it was primarily the teachers or past teachers who came out last evening, those who were able to. But I want to take a moment just to say thank you to Scott for putting that on along with Mary Ann. I want to say thank you to Mike and Brenda Rich who made some wonderful food, I'm sure with the help of Big Mama back there too. And so we appreciate so very much the gathering. And let me say this to the teachers that Christianity is a teaching religion. We pass on the ideas of Jesus via the Great Commission by teaching all things whatsoever we have been taught and the process and cycle continues. So a church does not function properly without people teaching of various kinds, whether that's Bible classes, whether that's parents teaching their children in the homes, whether that's someone standing and teaching the auditorium class or the adults. Teaching is a part of evangelism. It is a part of a, a healthy congregation. We use the word sound all the time. Is this a sound church? You know the word sound just means healthy and a church would not be healthy without really good dedicated teachers. So thank you to all who are teaching and have taught and for Scott and others who have worked through the years to organize that and our elders for facilitating that. It is super, it is vitally important. I want to take your attention this morning to a passage that is found in Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17. And I'll tell you why I'm going there to begin with in just a moment, but I'll just go ahead and let you be turning to Luke 17 verse 11. Now this particular passage was a part of our reading. We're trying to do that congregational reading through the New Testament. I hope you're doing that with us. If not, at any given point you can jump in. We've really only read Matthew, Mark, and almost all of Luke. Uh, we're going to be starting John soon, so if you want to jump in and at least get one of the Gospel accounts and do the rest of the New Testament with us, we would encourage you to do that, reading only about five chapters a week so we can study it. But uh, as far as the lesson before us this morning, let me use Luke 17 verse 11 and following to introduce the thought that I want to talk about. In Luke 17 and verse number 11, the Bible says, Now it happened, as he, Jesus, went to Jerusalem, that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. Then, as he entered a certain village, there met him ten men who were lepers who stood afar off. Now, in our auditorium class, Garrett reminded us why they would have been standing afar off. According to the law of Moses, you weren't to touch or be in close proximity to those who had leprosy. That is, various skin diseases that were prevalent. It was unclean. Verse 13, and they lifted up their voices and said, here's ten men all huddled together because they can only be near one another for they had leprosy. And Jesus is coming into their city, into their community, and they lift up their voices and they said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Now you think about it from their perspective. They were outcasts. They were shunned. They were unclean. People could not interact with them. Maybe they were husbands and fathers and could not be near their family and they were desperate and they saw Jesus and heard the stories about Jesus, maybe have even witnessed some of the miracles of Jesus and oh we're fortunate Jesus has just arrived let's get his attention and they say Jesus have mercy on us so when he saw them he said to them um, go show yourselves to the priest and so it was that as they went, they were cleansed. Jesus didn't need to be near them, though there were occasions He was near people that He healed. He didn't need to touch them, though there are occasions when He made a special point to touch people that He was healing. He didn't need to say some magical phrase and wave a wand. No, this is the power of God from on high. And He simply says, Oh, I do have mercy on you, although He didn't really say it, He implied it. Go and show yourself to the priest. 
that's the process according to the law of Moses they would go through once they had leprosy and had become clean and they had to document themselves as going from unclean to clean and because they complied with the orders as they went on the way the Bible says that they were healed and they became clean. Verse number 15 and one of them when he saw that he was healed he returned and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his feet at his or fell down um, on his face at his feet Jesus' feet giving him thanks and he was a Samaritan. Now let me ask you a question as we're reading this story that may uh, test your reading comprehension. How many men had leprosy at the beginning of this paragraph? Ten. How many of them cried out to Jesus to be healed? Ten. How many of them did Jesus tell to go and show yourself to the priest? Ten. How many of them were healed when they went to be shown to the priest? All ten of them are said to have been healed. Here's the question. How many of them came back to Jesus to fall at His feet and give thanks and glorify God? One. Now I know the passage is not saying that the rest just abandoned God. I'm not making it say what it doesn't. But I find it significant that only one out of the ten decided to come back and fall at Jesus' feet. Only one out of the ten decided, uh, as the story recounts, to give glory to God in the presence of Jesus and to thank God for the healing they had received. And when I'm reading this, along with many of you in our congregation, reading, the thought enters my mind of the reality we see in Scripture that Jesus would later state that many are called but few are chosen. The reality that most people who are introduced to Jesus in His ministry would actually reject Him as opposed to follow Him. And how that in the course of history we are trying to be an evangelistically minded congregation and we're doing our best to do that. Are there room for improvement? Yes, I hear statements all the time of how we can improve. Certainly we can improve and we're working on that. But... but the majority of people that will be invited to Jesus will turn down that invitation. The in, in majority of people who have heard the gospel will not respond positively or receptively to the gospel. And so that reminds me, if you will, of what we are here to discuss this morning here in the Bible text. You know, I also think of a few other passages. Let's look at the Bible story, kind of hit some bullet points and make some observations. In Matthew chapter 8... Beginning at verse number 18, I want you to read here another occasion when Jesus interacted with some people in the midst of His ministry. And in Matthew 18 and ver or Matthew 8 and verse 18, And when Jesus saw great multitudes about Him, He gave a command to depart to the other side. Then a certain scribe, a man who was the intellectual, a man who was learned in the law, a man who was supposed to know the Scriptures very well, when a certain scribe came and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Now that's an enormous promise to make, isn't it? But notice how the rest of the conversation goes. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nets, nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Are you sure you're ready to do what you just said you would do? I mean, you're probably used to having a home to live in. I don't have a home to live in. Do you know the sacrifice you will need to make in order to truly follow me? Jesus says, He would say elsewhere, make sure we're willing to count the cost first because there's sacrifice involved. He says, foxes of, uh, have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay His head. And then another, around this same time, another of His disciples said to Him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, follow me right now. I'm asking you to put off something that I know means a lot to you, but I'm asking you to demonstrate that I come first if you're truly following me truly sacrifice something meaningful to you in order to follow me and I'm asking you to do that without first going and putting the burial of your father ahead of me. He says, follow me 
and let the dead bury their own dead. This is not a universal command. He's not discouraging us from taking time to mourn. It was a specific incident, but there's another reminder that most people are not willing to do what it takes to follow Jesus in the long run. Another passage to consider, and probably the first one I thought of when reading, when the lesson idea came to mind. In John chapter 6, you may remember the events that surround this incident, but in John chapter 6, Jesus, in chapters 5 and 6, six Jesus feeds the 5,000. He goes to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Many of those 5,000 who were fed, oh, we saw a miracle, we saw something special. We reaped a benefit from being around Jesus. We got food we didn't have to pay for. So many of them almost ran or hurried to the other side of the sea so that when Jesus' boat hit the other shore, they were there and they met Him and they greeted Him where Jesus had already fed them because they were hungry physically. Now when he gets to the other side, he's ready to feed them spiritually. So in John chapter 6, he preaches this sermon. And they didn't like the contents of that sermon. That sermon did not set well with them. Hey, if you're feeding us, we like that, but we're not into what you have to say. Now, it was somewhat difficult to understand because he says, unless you eat my body and drink my blood, you are not following me. Now, of course, the lesson there was that was uh, signifying something else. But in verse 60, the Bible says, and there were multitudes. There. Again, 5,000 people, but the Bible now calls them multitudes of people. Oh, Jesus is popular. He is well received, right? No. Verse 60, therefore, many of His disciples, when they heard this, the sermon that He just preached, they said, this is a hard saying, and who can understand it? When Jesus knew in, in Himself that His disciples complained about this, He said to them, Does this offend you? What then if you should see the Son of Man ascend where He was before? Now for sake of time, let's kind of jump down to verse 66. You can read the verses in between on your own. He, the Bible says that they heard the lesson. They said, who can accept this? This is such a hard saying. Jesus knew within His heart saying, they're complaining, saying that they, they don't like what I said. Verse 66, from that time, what's it say? Many of His disciples went back... And what's it say, church family? They walked with Him no more, the Bible says. Then Jesus said to the twelve, that is the twelve apostles, Do you also want to go away? You know, Jesus knew these men and knew these men intimately, probably, yes, certainly more than they knew themselves, but Jesus still gives us a choice. He still gave His disciples, His apostles a choice. They're leaving. Do you also want to leave? But Simon Peter, whom I love, as the Bible reveals him, Simon Peter answered and said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and to know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You know... When I reflect upon this, there's a few things that come to mind. Number one, the majority of people who saw Jesus in the flesh rejected Him. The majority of people who sat at the very feet of Jesus and heard the gospel from the source of the message, Jesus Himself, the majority rejected Him. From an evangelistic standpoint, do not let Satan discourage you when people turn down Jesus. Oh, it's not pleasant. It is a sad tale. But brethren, it happened to Jesus too. Right? It happened to Jesus too. And when we have loved ones and friends and brothers and sisters in Christ who we most if not all of us have known who have walked away from the Lord, I know that's sad. That saddens us and it should because we care for their soul. But may we not let Satan use that as a means of discouraging us or making us think everything is falling apart or rob us of our joy. Yes, it's sad when there are people we love dearly. But what we can worry about, be concerned with is our relationship with God, right? At the end of the day, we can be concerned with that. You know, Jesus would say it very plainly in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 7, beginning at verse number 13, He says, Enter by the narrow gate, 
But, but, but you're narrow-minded. Wait, wait a minute. The gospel and the way to Jesus is narrow. We're told this lie oftentimes that, that the way to heaven is broad and the way to Jesus is broad. And you can believe this, 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 and this, and it really doesn't matter. Some people say as long as you have faith. Some people say as long as you are a good person. Some people say as long as you in some way, shape, or form profess the name of Jesus, of course. There are those who even say that if you go beyond Jesus. But Jesus says we are to enter by the narrow gate. Narrow gate does not mean closed-minded. Narrow gate does not mean stuck in our ways. Narrow gate doesn't mean we accept the fundamental version of the truth, but are too stagnant, if you will, to grow to the deeper, deeper levels of that truth. That's not what narrow gate means. Narrow gate means there's one way to heaven. Narrow gate means there's one man by whom we can have salvation, and that's through Jesus Christ. Narrow means that it excludes every other supposed path to forgiveness. He says, enter by the narrow gate for, let's consider the alternative, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to, what's the Bible say, church family? Be careful about what the majority are doing. Be careful about what everyone else is doing. Be careful about what is most popular because Jesus tells us right there in His teaching and preaching in the Sermon on the Mount that the majority will choose the broad path. The majority will be led to destruction. But He goes on to say, and there are many who go in by it. Many. But because narrow is the gate, verse 14, and difficult is the way. Oh, wait a minute. Underline that word difficult. Why did the majority of people in John 6 leave Jesus after they heard His sermon? This is too difficult. This is too difficult. And so He says, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way, which does lead to life as opposed to destruction. And here's the point. Jesus comes right out and says, how many people will choose to do the difficult thing? How many? Few. That's right. And of course, what that is telling us is Jesus is saying most, of course, most rejected Jesus in His day. Most have rejected Jesus through the ages. Don't be surprised if most reject Jesus today. And don't be surprised if far more people turn down our invitation to Christ than accept it. Because Jesus has told us all along, this is the way it will play out. And so the challenge I have for you and for me and for my family and for yours is that we be one of the few. <laughs> Ryan, I'm asking you because you're a former Marine. What's the Marine slogan? The few, the proud. The, the few, the proud, the Marines. I thought it was, I'm glad I got that right. How about we be the few proud in Jesus? How about we be followers of Christ? How about be, we be one of the few? How about we be one of the few that says, Lord, I will accept your invitation. How about we be one of the few that says, yes, I know it is difficult. I know that there is work and responsibilities and struggles. But I will be one of the few that steps into that role and follows you bravely wherever you will lead. I know I'm in the minority, but I'm one of the few, if it is the few, that will follow you. Though none go with me, I still... We'll follow. You remember that song we sing, right? So my question naturally arises when we learn, when we know this already without digging into the Scriptures because we've seen it through our experience. But I take a degree of comfort in that even this, this was even Jesus' experience. And having understood that most that will be confronted with Jesus are not up for the task, I ask the question, why do people, generally speaking, not want to commit fully to Christ and serve Him and follow Him? Why is that a struggle for them? Why is that a struggle for me? Why is that a struggle for us? Now let me say this before I jump into the second half of the lesson. Jesus says that our, His commandments are not burdensome. 
Satan wants us to think they're too heavy of a burden to bear. That's actually a lie. That's not true. But let me suggest to you that Jesus hit the point right on the head and revealed for us why most will reject Him because His teachings are too difficult to follow. Not too difficult. His teachings are difficult to follow and most people don't want to do that which is difficult. Let's just face it. Most people don't want to do that which is difficult. Christianity is not a burden. But let me also say something that some people need to hear. Christianity is not a walk in the park either. Christianity requires grit. It requires sacrifice. It requires commitment. Christianity requires work. And I know that we've discussed that recently and, and it's unpopular in some circles to admit that reality. But what is a Christian at the end of the day? I, I've got to tell you that I've changed my position on this statement in the course of my studies. I used to say that a Christian is someone who has heard, believed, repented, confessed, and been baptized into Christ. The question is, are they a faithful Christian or an unfaithful Christian? I don't hold to that position anymore. I hold to the position that a Christian is someone who walks by faith and not by sight. The Bible says we're saved by faith. The Bible says faith is active. So a person who is a Christian is someone who has repentance as an act of their faith, is a person who has confession as an act of their faith, is a person who has been baptized, immersed into Christ as an act of their faith. It is a person who loves Christ first and God first and their neighbor as their self as an act of faith. A Christian is someone who is acting on the teachings of Jesus. We may call it faithfully living according to the teachings of Christ. Here's the where, where my position has shifted to some degree. The Bible says if I'm not walking by faith, I'm not a Christian. If I say I'm a Christian, but I'm not actively acting in the way God has commanded, I'm just not a Christian. I'm a fake Christian. If I used to be a faithful Christian, but now I have ceased living by faith, I'm sorry, you're not a Christian any longer. The Bible definition of a Christian is one who follows Christ. And if I used to follow Christ, but I have abandoned Christ, then I'm no longer following Christ. Therefore, I'm no longer a disciple. I can become a disciple again. And there is a different avenue back for those who once followed Christ, such as repentance and prayer and not needing to be rebaptized, for instance. But let's just call it like it is. There's a lot of people claiming to be Christians that are not Christians in the Lord's church and outside the Lord's church. And that's the teaching of Christ in a nutshell on passages like this. You know, again, Jesus would say in Matthew 22... Matthew 22 and verse number 14. I could quote it for you, but here it is for you. He says, For many are called, but few are chosen. And by the way, the Bible says Jesus calls all of us. Jesus died for all of us. Whosoever believes that act of obedient faith can have eternal life. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all, the Bible says. So many are called, but only few choose to accept that calling and follow Jesus. Why is that, may I ask? Because it's difficult. Christianity is not a walk in the park. By the way, if we go to... Hebrews chapter 11. I'll just notice this, and I know the New King James reads it a little differently than other translations do. In Hebrews 11 and verse 6, but in the manuscripts on which the King James and New King James are based off of, this word is, accu this word is in there and accurately translated. But in verse number 6, the Bible says, but without faith it is what? What's the next word? Impossible, Impossible to please Him, to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who do what? Diligently, diligently seek him. Now in this passage we are told the only way to be pleasing to God is faith. The rest of this chapter goes on to describe what faith looks like. It is trusting in God, it is active, it is obedient, it has a lifestyle of godliness behind it. Without true biblical faith, coupled together with good works, as we would read in James, it is impossible to please God outside of that type of faith. But he goes on to even make the point stronger when he says, we've got to be working 
diligently working at seeking and pursuing God in every aspect of our lives. In Titus 2, we'll go through these quickly. In Titus chapter 2, in verse number 14, notice what he says after having this discussion about the grace of God and the salvation that comes from Jesus Christ. Regarding Christ, it says, "...who gave Himself for us, that He might redeem us from every lawless deed, and purify for Himself His own special people, zealous for what?" Zealous for good works. Well, to be a Christian and to be a true follower of Christ demands diligent seeking. Many people don't want to do that. To be a true follower of Christ requires being zealous and excited and on fire for the Lord so much so that it's seen in our good works. Then you probably know other passages that say the same, but let's move on. Go to Romans chapter 12 and verse number 1. Why do so many walk away from Jesus? Well, maybe because they don't want to do the work, but maybe because they don't want to make the sacrifice. And in Romans 12 and verse 1, he says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. That sounds like a pretty big deal. That sounds like a whole lot to give up. But what we give up in sacrificing our whole lives for Jesus, we gain many times over in the rewards we have in this life and in the life to come. By the way, I know that because of what I read in Mark chapter 10... In verse number 28, early in my ministry when I was not living where I used to call home, and I didn't have a lot of friends and family and loved ones around me, and I was getting homesick and discouraged, this passage gave me, gave me hope. Jesus tells Peter here, then Peter began to say to him, See, we have left all and followed you. So Jesus answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left houses or brothers, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my sake and the gospels, who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come will he not receive eternal life. What we sacrifice in the here and now will be more than worth it in the life to come. What I lost when I became a Christian, you know, I, my, many of my family and friends were very worldly, sinful-minded people. I had to walk away from those relationships the day that I accepted Christ. The relationships I lost have been more than gained back in the family of fellow believers I have in Christ. Many people do not follow Christ because of the work and diligence it takes. Many people do not follow Christ because of the sacrifice that Jesus requires. You know, here's a passage from the Old Testament, in case you think that we don't use the Old Testament. But in Proverbs chapter 16, in verse number 3, we see here that David or that Solomon writes, Commit, commit your works to the Lord, and your thoughts will be established. We have other passages we could bring up, such as Revelation 2.10, Be faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. Let's just face it, many do not stay too true to the journey of Christ because of a lack of commitment. Commitment is difficult, is it not? Persevering, staying true to Christ through the hard times, not abandoning the teachings of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It takes commitment, but we are told that if we stay true to Christ, even if our life is on the line, the reward is a crown of life in heaven above. Here's some other passages very quickly. In the New Testament again, in the book of Luke, here's a passage that I think is worth pondering on. In Luke chapter 9, in verse number 23, Then he, Jesus, said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself. Listen, many people do not follow Christ. Let's just be honest because of selfishness. You know, someone asked me on one occasion that was not in a church setting or even by a Christian, if the teachings of Jesus are so powerful like you say, why do most people not follow them? And my answer to that person was, a lot of the things we're already saying, many people don't want to do the work, they're not sac willing to sacrifice, not willing to commit. But I think it comes down in a lot of cases to people want to make themselves their own God. People do not like telling themselves no. 
People want what they want and they want it now and they want to keep on getting what they want and they will not for one minute be okay with a lifestyle that says that I do the will of another over my own will. I will do what I want to do. Do not tell me how to live. How many times have you heard that line? But what's Jesus say? You're not really a true follower of me until you deny yourself. You're just not a... You can call yourself a Christian. I can call myself a Christian. But am I really a Christian if I'm going to keep on doing things my way? The answer is almost... almost it's certainly no. You're, I'm not a Christian. Not by the biblical sense of the word. He says, unless you deny yourself, and here's the next part, and take up your cross daily and follow me. There's two ways this has commonly been interpreted, the idea of taking up our cross. Number one, it's bearing the responsibilities that every Christian has to bear. Holy living, treating others with dignity, putting God first, doing good works, teaching people the, uh, the gospel. But another way this can be seen is what did the cross represent for Jesus? For us, it represents a Savior. But what did the cross represent to people in the first century? It represented death. What did Jesus just tell them? To deny themselves. It represents a death to the old man. It represents that I put to death and I'm no longer interested in me being me and my personal identity. I'm now making my personal identity the identity of Christ Himself. That's why the Bible says in Philippians 2.5 that we are to aim to have the very mind of Christ within us. Most people don't want to do that. They love their individuality. Listen, I lean in that direction. I lean rebellious. I lean individualistic. If there's a popular anything, I'm often bucking against it intuitively. I can't do that as a Christian. As a Christian, my identity is Jesus Christ. People don't want to do that, so they say, I'm not going to follow Christ. Legitimately follow Christ. There's another statement, and we'll wrap this up very quickly. By the, take the word quickly when a preacher uses it very lightly, please. <laughs> 2 Timothy 3 and verse number 12. He's writing to Timothy and says, Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ will... What's it say? Can you get any more plain than that? Anyone who desires to live godly in Christ Jesus, it is not an if, it is not a maybe, it is a fact. We will suffer some degree of persecution. Now we can take that word persecution and apply it to any normal, any uh, way we can from just being spoken against to being uh, pursued after with violent intent. But you get the point there. And then in John chapter 16, or sorry, John, John has a lot to say about this. But in John chapter 16, in verse number 33, notice what Jesus says. He says in verse 33, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. Jesus wanted us to have peace. Here's why. He wanted to prepare us to be people of peace who have inner peace that surpasses all human understanding. Here's why He wants us to have peace. Because in the world, you will, I will, have tribulation. But He says, don't let that bother you too much. Be of good cheer. He says, I have overcome the world. He goes on to say, if you follow me, know they hated me and killed me, and they will hate you and want to kill you. And it just so happens, out of the twelve... It seems that at least 11 of those 12 men who initially followed Jesus, they died in sometimes brutal fashion because they were attached to the name of Christ. Most people don't want to accept Christ when they realize what it takes to accept Christ. Most people are not interested in being Christians genuinely by the Bible definition in the church and outside the church, may I add. Most people only want to have Jesus as our Savior, but they've not quite learned what it means to have Jesus as our Lord. Jesus is telling us, you cannot have me as your Savior until you first make me your Lord. May we count the cost. May we be one of the few. May we bravely walk in the steps of Jesus wherever that may lead. 
May we work diligently to do His will and glorify His name. May we sacrifice whatever needs to be sacrificed. May we be committed unto the very end. May we take up our responsibilities and proudly fulfill them, knowing Christ receives the glory. May we endure the hardships. If we do that, there is great reward. There is a crown of life in heaven above. Will you at this time come and follow Jesus Christ with faith, repentance, confession, and baptism? Will you come back to Him and walk that road? It may be narrow. It may be difficult. His commandments are not burdensome. It will all be worth it if we will give, it a chance, give Him a chance. Come and give Him a chance as we stand and as we sing. Just as I Thank you so much for being here today. We uh, invite you to come back and be with us at every opportunity we have, which the next one will be this evening at 6. We have a few other announcements that need to be made, so I'll keep this brief. We ask you to fill a card out at the beginning of service, both members and visitors alike. We'll take those up now by passing those to your aisles in this direction, pass them down the pew to the aisles, and we'll have those taken up. Um, we hope you have a good rest of your day, and I'll turn it over, I guess, to Daryl first, and then we'll go here. I've been gone about three weeks uh, in Jacksonville with a construction job with my uh, son-in-law, and I didn't realize I'd been gone so long until Sheila introduced herself to me as if I was a visitor. <laughs> That's not good. Anyway, glad to be back in town. Today's Mission Monday, which is actually Sunday. We're going to change that name somewhere along the line, I'm sure. But we need help uh, to go out and take the uh, and visit one person this month and uh, we've got the, the uh, papers and, and all in the back over here. Uh, the bags for, uh, for Mission Monday will be here tonight. Uh, so if you will, uh, pick the bag up tonight uh, to make that visit. We really need your help. And uh, just like TJ was talking about, uh, we need more than just a few people helping with this project to make it successful. And I hope you'll help us with that.
Uh, the compassion card room is set up and ready to go. I apologize, it was not ready to go before class. So if you tried to go in there right after class was over this morning, you looked on the wall and there were no names. Uh, but it is set up and ready to go now. Uh, and so I think it's work team three this week. If you're not sure, look on the back of the bulletin. Uh, please, I wanna solicit, please continue to keep in mind your friends, your family members, people in town that we can write cards to and uh, turn those names in, uh, fill out a contact card that's out on the evangelism table. We're getting low on list of names, so we wanna make sure that we've got opportunities to reach out to folks that are in need. And just one more thing. Um, uh, there was a little bit of confusion about Florida Bible Camp. Um, all of the registration is done online. We are week two. Um, the registration is done online. Please check that you will pay via check. Uh, and then please also let me know so that way uh, I have a good list of everybody who's going. But registration is available for uh, week two of Florida Bible Camp. So you can go online and it's a pretty easy process to uh, register and go ahead and send that in. And then just if you have any questions about where to find that or any other things, just please let me know. Number 512, and then we'll be closed in prayer. 512, please. Mm. Be not dismayed, whatever. Please join me in the closing prayer. Heavenly Father, we're very thankful for this time that you've allowed us to come together. We're thankful for our elders that lead us. Father, we're thankful for the deacons that provide the work. Father, we also are thankful for all of our teachers. Father, we're thankful for those that participated in our teacher appreciation night last night. And we pray that you'll be with all of them. Father, we ask, ask that you be with us all as we seek diligently to follow your word. And Father, we're thankful that we have your son, Jesus Christ, to help us and have, have our sins forgiven. Father, we ask now that you be with us throughout the rest of this day. And all these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.